It's my great pleasure today to welcome you and to welcome to Notre Dame, Dr. Thomas Elsesser. Thomas is a professor emeritus from the University of Amsterdam. He also has a distinguished career at many other universities and as a continuing fellow, um, most recently at Yale for five years and now at uh, Columbia University. He is uh, the author of so many books and articles that it would take the rest of the afternoon for me to okay. recite them, not to mention using up all the available RAM that I have left up here. <laughs> Let me just say that his, um, uh, interestingly, his very first work and his most recent works have been on the interaction, interface of Hollywood and European cinema, so he's an especially appropriate speaker for the Nanovic to sponsor. And um, let me just say that um, he was not too long ago appointed a knight by Queen Beatrix of who is about to resign. The Netherlands. I hope it's not because of me. <laughs> <laughs> so please welcome uh, Sir Dr. Thomas Elsesser. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very generous invitation. I'm delighted to be here at Notre Dame. It's my very first time. And I'm especially honored to be a guest of the Nanavid Institute. I will be talking for pretty well uh, the best part of an hour. Uh, but I hope to be able to break the, uh, the flow with uh, one or two of our visuals as well. What I'm presenting to you today is an attempt to build upon arguments I first proposed in a book that uh, uh, Don almost mentioned, namely <laughs> European Cinema Face to Face with Hollywood, about the precarious self-construction of European auteur and national cinemas as the good other versus Hollywood, uh, that is uh, along lines of the many binary oppositions that film studies have generated uh, art versus commerce, auteur versus star, critical reputation versus box office. Now today I'm interested in putting forward a more philosophical case for why and how the cinema might be considered to be an important, if not indispensable, actor in bringing about a different self-understanding of what it means to be part of Europe and part of European cinema. Especially I want to ask how can the cinema contribute to reshaping notions of community, of the social contract, that have political consequences for the future of Europe, which, as you know, is in a rather parlous state these days. My tentative hypothesis is that besides a common market and a common currency, there might also be a set of common ethical values philosophical principles, or indeed shared historical traumas, such as the Holocaust or colonialism, that unites Europe as a distinct entity, as a distinct cultural entity, but also perhaps as a filmmaking entity. What is it that defines directors, films, and cinema practices when they can no longer depend on an opposition to Hollywood for their self-definition. My argument in the book is that for many, many years, probably since the 19-teens and 20s, or certainly since the, post, the end of the, the First World War, Hollywood has always been the other against which European cinema felt it had to define itself. At the same time, it felt it was the only other of Hollywood. My argument in the book is that certainly since um, the 80s and 90s, uh, there has been a shift in attention also in the world of cinema, where Europe, you know, cinematic Europe, the cinema of the great auteurs, uh, Ingmar Bergman, Fellini, but also of the younger generation, Fassbinder, uh, uh, Jean-Luc Godard, have diminished in importance uh, in relation to, let's say, the rise of Asian cinemas, Korean cinema, Chinese cinema. So there's a parallel between the shift in importance of Europe as a continent and European cinema. But what really has changed is that 
Europe, European cinema is no longer the privileged other of American cinema, of Hollywood, and therefore figures in at least um, the continental uh, United States very much more as part of world cinema, which of course creates a slight narcissistic wound uh, when you thought of yourself as being the privileged other of, of America. Anyway, so um, uh, this would be the, the situation that I'm now trying to uh, reposition on slightly different grounds. And I think what's happened when uh, European cinema is, is, as it were, demoted to world cinema status is a certain dilemma emerges. And the dilemma is probably best characterized when directors are pressed into the service of representing their country, especially when they are their country's dissenting or critical voices. If you think about the way that films from Iran, from Israel, or Turkey have often been received in the rest of the world as the only voice they can speak on behalf of a more enlightened part of the country, the better version of the country. But this has also been the case of Germany in the 70s and 80s when people were still wondering how did Germany cope with its Nazi past and then very critical voices like Fassbinder, Herzl, Wenders were seen as a representative of the good Germany and this particular legacy of having to, as it were, represent your country and very often represent your country in terms that for an indigenous population may also be seen, as indeed it has been in Turkey, Iran, and Israel, that you're pandering to the perception and prejudices of the other and you're thereby bad-mouthing your own country. So that would be the dilemma that a lot of directors uh, find themselves, especially in the film festival circuit, exposed to when they are asked to represent their, or where they assume to represent their country. I call this in, the, in, in my book the tendency towards auto-exoticism. In other words, that you exoticize or, if you like, orientalize yourself in the eyes of the other. So my, my, the proposal that I'm making is that there may be a way out of this, or what might be the way out of it. Once, uh, for instance, you know, I might add this uh, just uh, because we talked about this earlier, uh, films from Central and Eastern Europe have had to meet foreign expectations in recent years of how these countries dealt with their communist past while struggling to redefine their post-communist national identity without becoming neo-nationalists. This is a predicament very clear right now in Hungary and also in Poland. The more sophisticated response to this impasse is to try and speak to the world at festivals in a distinct cinematic language and with a unique voice while not being beholden to either a nationalist or an anti-nationalist agenda. There has, in the recent decades, uh, emerged a cinema of what's sometimes called contemplative cinema. A cinema of purity of images, barely touched or contaminated by strong plots and narrative, uh, without an apparent message, and thus showing us a world either darkened by relentless existential despair, as, for instance, the film I've chosen for tonight, Belantar's Hungarian uh, um, touring horse, or washed clean again, reborn as it were, in the spirit of poetry and presence, which possibly applies to the film that I'm talking about uh, um, this afternoon, namely Claire Denis' Beau Travail. Other directors that fit this particular category are Pedro Costa from Portugal and the Turkish director Nuri Bilge Sela. Now, be before I talk some more about these directors, in particular Claire Denis, I want to just sketch a further context, namely the title of my talk, Heroic and Post-Heroic Narrative. The United States' understanding of its exceptionalism and its democracy has always been a heroic account of how to think political divisions productively, uh, the ever more perfect union, uh, the uh, 
perfectibility and the greatness of the United States, these would be classical marks of a heroic narrative of national unity and coherence. And it has been used, as we see in every presidential election, as a way of overcoming divisions, of minimizing the differences, uh, nothing 47%, nothing 1%, and so on. Um, but in Europe, and uh, patriotism and the flag are the non-negotiable elements of this particular heroic narrative in the United States. For Europe, especially if you remember how very recently most of the nations that now form part of the European Union were at daggers drawn and uh, fighting each other uh, uh, to the death. For, for Europe, the challenge has been, and it was aggravated since the end of the Cold War, to imagine what I call a post-heroic version of these, these values, these legacies, as well as maintaining or recognizing difference, divisions, and tensions, uh, including the recognition that antagonisms and dissensus and disagreement can actually be mutually beneficial, if not providential. In other words, the post heroic narrative is one that doesn't want to find the co lowest common denominator, but actually valorizes difference. But as I shall try and indicate, there are complications to that model. As I've already hinted at, it's almost a cliche by now that the fall, uh, with the fall of communism and the unification of Germany and the subsequent enlargement of the European Union since the 1990s, instead of strengthening Europe in the global context, they, these, move, these uh, developments appear to have accelerated the decentering of the continent in relation to the Americas, to China, and other Asian nations. An aging population, the bold burden of an unaffordable welfare state, and the reluctance to accept and integrate immigrants were among the reasons most often blamed for Europe's loss of self-confidence and initiative even before the debt crisis of 2008 created new tensions between the still affluent North and the once more struggling South. As a consequence, Europe no longer has a heroic narrative of self-identity to draw. The French and American Revolution, Rousseau and Hobbes' social contract leading to democracy, the critical hermeneutics of the Enlightenment, which established empirical knowledge, technological improvement of life, and the prospect of unlimited progress, all these represented parts of the heroic narrative of collective self-creation and self-realization, very similar to the, the United States. Now that the various nations realize how much this heroic narrative was also based on imperialism, colonialism, and slavery, on exploitation and exclusion, many Europeans are no longer quite so sure or indeed proud of it. Yet so far, Europe has failed to consider the possibility of a post-heroic narrative, whatever this might turn out to be, and instead it has turned obsessively towards its own past, towards commemoration, towards heritage and collective nostalgia. At the same time, the fracturing of the social contract accompanied by a growing deficit in democracy brought about by increasing distrust of government by elites, that is, bureaucratic and technocratic elites, has, so the argument goes, been aided and abetted by European intellectuals, mostly on the left, who have undermined Europe philosophically through atheism, skepticism, nihilism, critical theory, deconstruction, and so on. These intellectuals have systematically, so the argument goes in some quarters, cast doubt on Europe's moral, epistemological, and ontological foundations, most notably by challenging the values of Enlightenment humanism. And in the process, they have embraced forms of social constructivism that ended up distrusting the legitimacy of Europe's political institutions, breeding thereby both cynicism, otherwise known as postmodernism, and apathy. These supposedly corrosive effects of post-metaphysical philosophy could, however, be also the starting point, this is my argument, for precisely post-heroic narratives, 
which accommodate both Europe's much diminished role in the age of globalization and formulate a different basis for a social contract on the far side of either nostalgia or nihilism, of resurgent nationalisms or fundamentalist religions. By reviving, for instance, Kantian notions of cosmopolitanism with its recognition of the paradoxical, and I quote Kant, unsocial sociability of man, unquote, philosophers such as Jean-Luc Nancy, to whom I will return, along with Jacques Rancière, Giorgio Agamben, and others, have proposed new thinking about singularities and collectivities and their relation to each other. I'll just show you a picture of uh, Jean-Luc Nancy to benevolently look down on us. <laughs> These philosophers explore notions of community and of multitudes after the demise of the great utopian <coughs> millenarian totalitarian and progressive social projects that have dominated European political thinking over the past 200 years. Such a need to recast um, the idea of community is, however, far from accepted wisdom amongst the policymakers of the European Union, that is, the politicians that we see sometimes on our screens, the Angela Merkels or the uh, David Camerons. But in the meantime, it could help delineate a post-heroic narrative for a post-national Europe, a project that might find in the cinema its imaginative test bed. This, of course, is uh, uh, a fairly far-fetched suggestion that I'm making. But nonetheless, the evacuation of traditional party politics, all parties, political parties now converge towards an indistinct center, the uneven distribution of job opportunities across North and South and so on, um, given this state, it's very difficult to sell something like a post-national Europe. In fact, there seems to be a retrenchment around the, na the nation state. On the other hand, the crisis in legitimacy and sovereignty of the nation state has also given rise to the centrality of human rights as the foundational logic that legitimates political action, including external interference in other countries' internal affairs and military intervention. We had this in Europe, the debate that you now have about drone attacks, we had in a different form during, in Europe during the Bosnian War, where many countries were rather, well, certainly we had it during the, the Iraq War, where Germany was very adamant about not joining the coalition. Uh, and indeed France as well. Uh, with the Bosnian War close to home, uh, what, uh, politicians had to mobilize human rights, they had to mobilize the Holocaust, uh, all kinds of uh, traumas and ideals in order to persuade the population to acquiesce when uh, the, uh, the federal uh, government in Germany sent troops to, uh, to Sarajevo and, and Bosnia. Anyway, um, so there, there is actually another level, you know, the, through the, uh, the diminished powers of the, of the nation state has created a basis for uh, common action, if you like. Uh, and this logic implies that the European nations delegate to supranational bodies the task of prosecuting political crimes, negotiating over minority rights, or seeking justice for crimes against humanity. Most of these courts, of course, the, America, the United States are not members of and don't subscribe to. But uh, this is perhaps too little known that, you know, with all the negative publicity about the, about the European Union that you hear, there are some really extraordinary achievements through these uh, uh, International Court of Human Rights or the way that individual citizens anywhere in the European Union can take their case to Strasbourg and start proceedings against their own government pretty unthinkable in the United States, as you know. So a post-heroic narrative, in contrast to recovering old or new universals, like or including even uh, um, the universal of human rights, would seek to find common ground between the religions or opposite po shared mutual responsibilities and interest, would nonetheless, as I said, affirm antagonism, incompatible interests, and incommensurable value systems. 
while still insisting that there are things that bind singularities into a community. As already suggested, much of the contemporary European philosophy is concerned with such questions, including the foundation of democracy and the social contract. These concerns must be seen against, as I said, uh, the, f the background of the failures of socialism, of communism, and the disasters of the fascist communities of male bonding, as well as the failure of other versions of the collective we. Whether that's Marxist revolutionary subject uh, and the working class as a collective agent in the struggle for change and social justice. In light of the various tribalisms, sectarianisms, and communities based on race and ethnicity, which seem to have re-emerged on the back of these failures, the question of whether there are other ways of relating to one another has become urgent and political. Yet in what way, ways are any of these reconstruction efforts, whether the post-Marxist Marxist one of somebody like Benedict Anderson and his imagined communities, or the Lersian versions as you find in Hart and Negri's multitude, or Foucauldian versions as in Judith Butler, in what ways are these reconstruction efforts uh, about communities um, relevant to any inquiry into post-national European cinema. If I'm right in arguing that a post-heroic European cinema would have to liberate itself from various schemata, for instance, the mirror schema of self and other, face to face, um, in its thematics as well as in mode of representation, then the cinema to come, you know, I'm use, now using uh, a version of a book by Giorgio Agamben called The Community to Come. The cinema to come, in this sense, um, would not only have to think its way past traditional notions of identity and difference, it would also have to rethink itself in cinematic terms and no longer assume that the screen functions as either a window or a mirror. These are the two abiding epistemologies of, on the one hand, classical popular cinema, where we usually think of the cinema and the screen as a window, and the mode is psychological or objective realism, and of modern art cinema, where the, the primary reference point is mirror, and where subjectivity is that which is being negotiated. Rather, such a cinema to come would deploy the screen as a surface that is neither transparent nor reflecting back but whose elements are in constant movement and flux, whose elements are distinct and singular, yet capable of forming new ensembles, new configurations, and new attributes in common, where uh, certain hierarchies and distinctions are no longer made. In European cinema face to face with Hollywood, I may have been too optimistic in suggesting the formation of new communities when discussing the crucial importance of film festivals for the survival of European cinema as an integral and valid part of world cinema. Wanted to construct a bridge between the idea of the post-national and its relevance for the cinema, I put forward the point that at film festivals, films address themselves to a community which is no longer either the national audience of popular genre cinema, nor the art cinema audience that religiously follows the careers of the great auteurs but instead an international, transnational festival audience made up of very different segments and constituencies, from critics and fellow filmmakers to cinephiles, but also including local audiences, as well as, as gender setting, interest <coughs> groups, pressure groups. And in the book, I suggest that such festival audiences might be addressed by a film which performs versions of the national at some stage, but also function in other ways. So a film or film auteur at a festival might be able to present and promote issues for which the context of a festival offers not a window on the world, but a unique window of attention and a serious forum for debate. More and more film festivals are now themed festivals concerned with specific issues. And this is why I put forward the idea of the film festival potentially serving as a kind of 
uh, NGO, a non-governmental organization, an alternative public sphere, or at least as a kind of placeholder for a, as an agora of a community to come. That was my suggestion in the book, and now I'm confronting that rather idealistic idea with something more ferociously critical of any of these notions. Because such talk of imagined communities, of social networks, of agor of the community to come, would be anathema to the philosopher I now turn to, uh, Jean-Luc Nancy. His ideas, difficult though they are, and bound up with an entire philosophical system, might nonetheless prove quite productive for thinking the aesthetics of films in the post-heroic mode of what he calls being singular plural. I'm not sure whether I have that uh, on my PowerPoint, but let's just see. Now here we have the coming community on the left, Giorgio Agamben, and the unavowable community by Maurice Blanchot, part of the same philosophical thinking. Here we have a picture of uh, Claire Denis with uh, uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, and here we have being singular plural and the inoperative community that I will be talking about. <coughs> By singular being singular plural, Nancy calls for the disbanding of any kind of substantive community, whether it be nation, ethnic, or faith-based faith community. But he has also been he has also dismissed as naive and utopian their opposite as it uh, um, is being used in, in new media discourses, namely uh, the hive minds, warm communities of technological mediation. According to Nancy, community as the dominant Western political formation is founded upon a totalizing exclusionary myth, basing itself on a presumed national, racial, or religious unity. It therefore must be unworked, made inoperative. The inoperative uh, community uh, here in the title, uh, in the French it's désœuvré, which is uh, a slightly different term, I'll come back to that. According therefore um, uh, to uh, Nancy, it must be made unworked or inoperative in order to accommodate more humbly inclusive, but also dissential forms of being in common, of dwelling together in the world um, under the present conditions of mondialisation, mondialisation, the French word for globalization, but also for world making. Coming from a Heideggerian tradition, Nancy argues within a very complex and precise field of conceptualization, which I'm here. I'm afraid horribly paraphrasing and bowdlerizing, but I will use it uh, to advance my own uh, argument. I take the core statement of his work to be a critique of Heidegger's notion of Dasein, conceived primarily around the singular being, against which Nancy pleads for an extension of Dasein towards the multiple, towards the singular and the multiple, understood as what comes after the people, but also, I quote, what can counter globalization as homogenization. This community is founded not on the imminence of individuals being in common, Dasein, but on the désoeuvrement, the unworking of togetherness into a being with, Mitzsein in Heidegger. This Mitzsein, this being with, is explicated by Nancy in a roundtable discussion with the uh, philosopher and NYU academic Avital Ronell, and I quote this, you can find this on the European Graduate Humanities website if you look for uh, Jean-Luc Nancy. This is a longer quote from this discussion. The with, you know, the being with, the with is a quasi-empty category for all philosophy. The whole scheme of our culture knows very well what it is to be in or out, to identify with something or to be totally exterior to it, to be homogeneous and to be heterogeneous. But to be with, this is the same thing as to say that the glass is with the pen on the table. He then points to a glass of water and a pen. 
and that to be on the table is a way of being with. What is that? In a certain way, this is nothing, because the glass and the pen have nothing to do with each other. If, if however, the pen is hidden behind the glass, you can't say that they are with each other. Or if I hide myself behind you, as avatar, there is no longer me with you. So with implies proximity and distance, precisely the distance of the impossibility to come to God together in a common being. That is the core of the question the community faces. Community doesn't have a common being, a common substance, but consists in being in common. From the starting point, it's a sharing, but a sharing of what? A sharing of nothing, of sharing the space between. End of quote from this uh, dialogue. With these thoughts, which posit at once a radical contiguity in commonness and a radical separateness in singularity, Nossi is yet another thinker at the forefront of the philosoph philosophical debate in Europe against multiculturalism and any kind of identity politics, where a group presumes to speak for individuals or constitutes itself as a fusion of tolerated differences. In line with my own questioning of the face-to-face, -face, <coughs> European cinema face-to-face -face with Hollywood, as a stabilization uh, of identity, Nossi acknowledges, like Levinas or Derrida, the inherent violence and asymmetry of any face-to-face. -face. Yet Nossi also generally defends a position similar to that of Alain Badiou, namely that radical otherness or alterity, as advocated by Levinas, is caught in an epistemological trap similar to that of the Cartesian subject-object split. The other, in this face-to-face, -face, the encounter uh, with the other or otherness and alterity, ends up somehow being the good other, the big other, which is to say the same as me, only in an idealized, projected, interjected form bringing us back to the mirroring dynamic of subjectivity, which is precisely the concept, subjectivity, amongst others, that Mitzai is designated to do away with. As a blurb on Nancy's book, The Inoperative Community emphasizes, I quote this blurb, contrary to West popular notions of community, Nancy shows that it is neither a project of fusion nor of production. This is an interesting, uh, I mean, I've been talked about the project of production, but what does he mean by it's not a project of production? I think this is where Nossi really challenges us. Not only are, are there conceptions of community, nation, or individuals that work on the divide of self, other, me, you, I, you, subject, object, inimical to the mid-sign as defined by Nossi. Mitzayn would be constitutive uh, of the shifting relations of distance and proximity, as I said, of contiguity and presence, uh, of a field of vision that in includes invisibility uh, and has all kinds of other possible and impossible reflections. But it would be a way of being in the world and among human beings and indeed amongst things which stops short of any suggestion of mutuality, reciprocity, or cooperation, as well as any necessary interdependence along the lines of, say, Hegel's master-slave dialectic. And as Nossi says, we operate in the West with categories of inside, outside, before, after, up, down, in front, off, behind, um, that is container metaphors, but we have little experience of what being with means and what it does not mean and how it is more than in between and indeed how it is something other than entanglement, hybridity or the metaphors of choice in post-colonial or multicultural discourses. So the inoperative community, the désœuvré communauté, is a community that's not a result of a production, be it social, economic, or political. It is neither constructed as a work, nor as a discourse or a creation. 
whether man-made or natural and God-given or God-given. Nasi thus opposes the idea of the state as a work of art, where even the nation is either chosen or self-created. You might say that in view of the, the notion that we now have very often, or the debates that we have about uh, online communities, think of the, the Arab Spring, think of Facebook, think of Twitter, you know, how there's this desire to make those into communities that can actually be progressive and bring about uh, political or social change. Um, all this is off uh, the agenda as far as Nossi is concerned. And indeed, these are harsh injunctions, and at first sight, they sit uneasily with any idea of a more perfect, that is, politically integrated European Union, and they seem equally hostile and inapplicable to any concept of European cinema as the expression of the creative endeavor or aesthetic autonomy of the artist auteur. Yet when it comes to the cinema, Nossi has named several directors in whose work he recognizes concerns similar to his own. One prominent uh, director is Abbas Kirastami, to whom Nossi has devoted an extensive study, The Evidence of Film, it's called, a theory of cinema that makes much of Mitzayan and that he sees translated into practice, especially in Kirastami's so-called Coquer trilogy, and in particular its second part, Life and nothing more often, 1991. Now the other auteur to whom Nancy has devoted both his philosophical attention and his personal friendship is Claire Denis, to whose film Beau Travail I now turn in order to test what might be an example of post-heroic European cinema in the spiritual spirit of the inoperable community. So I'm taking the friendship or the, the, the known association between Claire Denis and Jean-Luc Nancy to elaborate a Nancyan reading of uh, uh, Beau Travail, which is actually different from the Nancy read from Nancy's reading of the film that he is actually given. So I'm, as it were, impersonating Nancy, even though he has actually said something about Beau Travail, which I'll briefly quote, but that's not, those are not the terms that I use. But I do think that uh, Claire Denis' work, and Beau Travail in particular, fits into what I earlier called a cinema, the cinema to come, that treats the screen as neither window nor mirror, and that distributes its elements, its protagonists, their bodies, their gestures, and the space of nature and the sea very differently. But Beau Travail also features quite explicitly a very unusual set of protagonists held together and prized apart by both antagonism and indifference, by an imposed code of discipline and a self-chosen separateness, around which the idea of an inoperative community might be probed and given shape, especially when placed against the background of this notion of being singular plural. Now, Claire Denis, I don't have to introduce uh, her at any length because I believe you had her here at Notre Dame not so long ago. But I just want to emphasize one aspect of her rich and varied oeuvre. Claire Denis is both marginal and central to French cinema as a national cinema. Marginal in that her autobiographical background is quintessentially post-colonial. She was brought up in the parts of North Africa that feature in Beau Travail, uh, the area around Djibouti and the Horn of Africa. But she's also central to French cinema thanks to her uh, stint as an assistant director to several of the canonical directors of the Nouvelle Vague, notably her friendship with Jacques Rivet and her very close association with le cinéphiste par excellence, Serge Danet. Yet Claire Denis is also an in-between figure uh, because she stands between two, two generations of French auteurs. She came too late onto the scene to be part of the first generation that rejected the Nouvelle Vague in the 70s, but she's too old to belong to the Le Cinéma du Look, or the more recent New French Extremity Cinema, though her work has been cited as setting this movement's agenda. 
Because of her personal background, she also is in tune with the more recent hyphenated generations of filmmakers, you know, from the Maghreb, from North Africa, whose films touch on the topics of multiracial Europe and post-colonial France. French cinema, until the 1990s, when Denis came on the scene, had had relatively little to say about either post-colonialism or the ideology of multiculturalism. Since the Third Republic generally considered its colonial past as part of its civilizing mission and downplayed any consequences, negative consequences for the nation's self-image of its uh, African uh, colonies, even after the protracted and very brutal Algerian war, the cinema rarely broke this consensus, with the possible exception of Jean-Luc Godard's Le Petit Soldat, to which Beautravail explicitly refers to the character of Bruno Forestier, who plays the superior officer. There, there you see the, sorry, the young Bruno Forestier. I'll leave you with this one here, which is, uh, if you have the time to read it, uh, where he explains some of what I've been paraphrasing. As to the question of national identity and national community, the French state's approach to immigrants from Africa and the Maghreb region coming to France, either as cheap labor or as permanent immigrants, has been predominantly one of assimilation. That is, as long as they spoke French and abided by French laws and uh, subscribed to cultural French Francocentrism, there was little official acknowledgement or indeed political mandate for debating or contesting racism or religious discrimination. This has changed in, begun to change in recent years. Butravai, extremely successful on the festival circuit and as a DVD, has been a favorite on the academic circuit as well, being written up <coughs> by just about everyone working in French cinema. Uh, I will not uh, refer to many of those uh, uh, very massive uh, uh, articles. So, Without going into the stances taken by the critics, one can nonetheless identif identify recurring critical positions, among which the examination of the complex weaving of the minimalist plot is perhaps the most prominent. The film's temporal structure is indeed striking and disorienting, mixing flashback, time present, and flash forward, and also including scenes that seem both timeless in their pictorial beauty and atemporal in relation to the narrative development. These differential temporalities are motivated by the inner and outer world of a former officer of the French Foreign Legion, now living in Marseille. A brief encounter in the streets with a detachment of legionnaires reminds him of his past career, which ended ingloriously with his dishonorable discharge after jeopardizing the life of one of his subordinates in a premeditated plot to have him die uh, in the desert. Equally disorienting as, t as, as is the temporal structure is the optical and oral point of view that the film adopts. Like many French films, Beautravail has a voiceover commentary, as well as a hero who seems to be keeping a diary. Think uh, Robert Bresson's diary of a country priest. We therefore assume that the perspective of this camera is not only that of the central protagonist, but also of the story's hero yet the opening scenes quite specifically undermine any such perspectival alignment. And even when the voice and the body are introduced, we are made aware that the point of view we are sharing is not straightforward. Our officer hero, named Galoup, played by Denis Lavant, uh, better known for his work with Leos Carax, most recently in Holy Motors. Actually, that was the film I wanted to bring today, but. Uh, it was unavailable as a DVD. Uh, so what we think is the hero turns out to be the bad guy in that he took revenge on another soldier. Possibly, and these are speculation because the film is very ambivalent on that or deliberately ambiguous, possibly out of unrequited homosexual love, possibly out of rivalry over the attention of the commanding officer, possibly because he took his duties too seriously. I will suggest there is something else going on which relates to uh, our theme of the community. At the same time, we're also getting to see many scenes that could not have been witnessed by Gallup. 
This modernist flouting of the sequential temporal register, one thinks of Gilles Deleuze's crystal image as, the, uh, as a metaphor, and the unlocalized and unlocatable point of view of many of the scenes has been discussed by many critics. One, uh, for instance, has pointed out that these features are actually the strong personal signature uh, not of Claire Denis as such, but of her regular camera woman, Agnès Godard, and has demonstrated how images in the film respond to each other, how they build up subtle patterns, visual rhymes and unexpected correspondences in a way that might not have been possible if the images were more directly subservient to either the narrative or to Galoup's point of view. In other words, uh, uh, the suggestion that we have to share authorship for that film between Agnès Godard and Claire Denis. Yet these same stylistic features could also be read as making a quite persuasive case for Denis' mise-en-scene as teaching the audience what it might mean to be with someone. The mid discussed by Nancy as neither identification nor projection, neither inside nor outside, neither in front of nor hierarchically organized or fixed along perspectival sightlines. One of the remarkable features of Beautravail is the fact that as spectators, we are uncannily and very often uncomfortably close to the main character, and not only to him, but without thereby having access to any kind of interiority. Even where we do share uh, Galoup's point of view, and even when we hear his voice over or read his diary entries, he remains contiguous but distant, close but closed off. Perhaps comparable to Albert Camus' L'Etranger, one gets to know very little about this person's inner life. Yet the camera also keeps us very close to his body, his pockmarked skin, and his unruly hair. We are with him during banal ever everyday actions like washing his clothes, ironing his shirt, pruning a tree, writing in his notebook, cooking. We see the veins pulsing on his muscles. In short, we share a close physical intimacy without getting to know him. Especially the ending of Beautravail is a careful study in such ambiguity. Is Galou going to commit suicide? Has he already committed suicide? Or has he found some form of self-liberation in this final ecstatic dance, which releases pent-up energies and aggression, but also leaves him vulnerable <coughs> in his solitary singularity, making his acceptance of his fate the condition of re-entry into the community that expelled him. In other words, Galou would be something of what philosophers call an abject hero, while we, the audience, have to experience a sometimes awkward, sometimes bewilderingly intimate, and sometimes bafflingly remote condition of mid a being with that breaks with almost all the conventional spectator positions, such as voyeur or invisible fly on the wall, participant observer or aggressively implicated addressee. Instead, all possible forms of effective and perceptual response to the protagonist have to be reassessed by the spectator. Maybe this is the point where I can show you an extract from the film. <clears throat> Now, where, where do we get the, um, what we so carefully, <coughs> it's down here, it's probably this one here, right? Yes, yes, indeed. Gilles Santin, c'était son nom. 
C'est le nom qu'il a donné à la Légion quand il s'est engagé. Stop it here. Uh, this goes on, and then we, we go back to uh, um, him in his uh, Marseille apartment. But what we think might be a flashback then turns out to be not a flashback at all. So uh, on a very basic level, we're getting mixed uh, signals and have to constantly reorient ourselves. Um, right, thank you. I'll just show you a few of the. This is this is where he sees the uh, the legionnaires and is brought back to some of those things. Uh, here we have his commentary. There, some more of those exercises, those uh, bodies. Um, here he is uh, in the middle of this group. Here we see them ironing their shirts. Uh, this is Santin that he was talking about. This is uh, Bruno Forestier, the, uh, the commander. And here you have a series of images that I just wanted to show you because the film has become uh, a, a cult classic amongst the gay community. And here the uh, the shot, you know, very this when he lets him uh, le leads leads the soldier into the uh, the desert, the uh, kind of salt lake, uh, to to die, and he's rescued by uh, by the indigenous population. But you see how. How, how, what an you know, intense tactile experience um, she's trying to give us. Um, if I can have the light again, thank you. So, while Nancy has more to say about the all-male community in the film, uh, which in a short essay he likens to the monastic orders of mis medieval Christianity, even more appropriate for his notion of being singular plural would be the constitutive paradoxes at the heart of this uniquely French community. Not only a military unit and an all-male community, but the French Foreign Legion. I want to conclude by briefly examining what Claire Denis might, might have had in mind when tackling the French Foreign Legion in her film. Magisterially sidestepping the usual cinematic cliches of the French Foreign Legion, in Gary Cooper and Marlene Dietrich in Morocco, or Gary Cooper in Beaugest, or Jean Gabin in La Bandera, 
Denis crafts instead an astute commentary on a French dilemma, but also on a typically European situation where the very successes of the EU in overcoming the old nationalist enmities um, has also disarticulated the homology of state, nation, territory, and military, where each could stand for, reflect, or represent the other. Think again, the United States, how strongly the nation, state, territory is associated with the military. That, you know, the, uh, the, the delegation of powers, NATO and so on, has fractured that foundational unity that is so crucial for any kind of heroic articulation of the nation. Now, of course, state authority has been handed over to Brussels, with the consequence that civil society has been depoliticized, and the state increasingly functions merely uh, either as a dispenser of culture and ritual to maintain a semblance of national identity, or is reduced to playing the role of a management team that administers revenue and collects taxes while distributing welfare, health care, education and social services. Within this post-national European perspective, in other words, the disarticulation of state, nation, territory and military, the French Foreign League region is both unique and symptomatic. In one sense, it's a mere remnant of an earlier colonial age, replete with the paraphernalia of France's heroic self-celebration. Yet from another vantage point, it can also be regarded as a vanguard for precisely a new kind of community, one befitting the post-heroic national narrative. Recall the ritual of initiation and entry that I briefly mentioned in the extract I showed you. Those enlisting in the Legion change their names, they leave behind their previous identity, their nationality and their religion. In exchange for raising their previous selves, they not only gain a new name, but they're also sworn to serve and die for the glory of France, to become members of France's elite corps, defending the Grand Nation, yet also doing its dirty work, as it were, on the margins of law and legality, just as they often come from the margins, that is, the legionnaires come from the margins of their societies with criminal records or worse. In other words, they, they enter the legion as bodies without inner substance in order to become part of the sacred body, the core of the republic. A curious and deliberate transubstantiation takes place which we could describe as the taking in of the world's outcasts as abjects in order to give them a sacred mission to uphold the glory of France, but where, when required, they become once more France's own abjects whenever the Legion has to carry out missions that the regular French army either cannot or does not want to engage in. Beautravail's French Foreign Legion is made up of such bodies without subjectivities who, once inside the Legion, connect and collide but do not fuse or form a single body. The tensions, jealousies, ways of being together and separate begin to form patterns of contact, of touch and of routine, but there is nothing beyond in the way of sharing or give and take or mutuality or reciprocity. Without inwardness or subjectivity, there are a test case of Nancy's communauté désœuvré, but they are also a test case for a new cinema, neither mirrors of our subjectivities nor windows opening up on an exotic other world of the, or world of the other. Such a reading clarifies some of the ambiguities surrounding Galoup and also justifies him as the film's hero. His tra trajectory through the narrative is that of learning to become abject, half sacrificial, half self-selected, in that he opens himself up to the full contradictions of the Legion as made up of bodies that are at once abject and sacred and to whom he initially does not belong, being a French officer rather than a legionnaire. Whereas his superiors, Bruno, keeps himself separate and aloof, being a more ordinary cynic and nihilist who basically doesn't care and su who survives by chewing hash or coca leaves, Galou is touched by the beauty and grace of Santin, the Billy Butt figure in the film, whose simultaneous intrusion and aloofness provokes Galou into an obsession with his singularity, and which makes him punish Santin and send him to his death. Nossi, in his comments, 
seems to recognize some of that affinity of, of Denis Ligonnès with his community in, in employé when he describes them as existing, I quote, between having nothing to do and being continually on guard, suggesting that their enforced idleness and disjointed existence is actually their salvation. It would explain why Santin, the beautiful intruder, does not belong because he's too active, he's too much in the world without being with the world. A savior who can be sacrificed or indeed is then rescued, uh, but uh, not an abject who can become, in Giorgio Agamben's term, a homo sacer, like, as I claim, Galou becomes. While the latter suffers a solitary entry into the post-heroic, Santin is someone who is finally still too much part of the heroic project of self-creation or self-sacrifice. The paradox is underlined by a scene that acts as a foil to the galou santin opposition. A soldier who dies in a helicopter crash is immediately reclaimed as heroic and given a burial with all the military honors, even though he died neither in combat nor by sacrificing himself, but through a stupid accident. By contrast, Galou's particular heroism, if that's what it is, cannot be recuperated. His is a singular and unremarked symbolic death, but for all that, perhaps the more authentic and ethical one. Galou's journey, in other words, would then embody the contemporary complement to the heroic and increasingly phony narrative that we also see elsewhere of soldiers accident turned sacrifice or friendly fire for on behalf of the nation. They all have to be re-sacralized. He would be one of those ex uh, whose expulsion saves and purifies the community from which he's excluded <coughs> in sync with a larger narrative that allows the Legion to both perpetuate French colonialism and to cleanse it by a form of sacralized disavowal. On the other hand, Galou becoming abject in relation to the Legion would be an act of auto-sacralization with his final dance, a radical opening up, a voiding that is uh, usually foreclosed when you, are, uh, uh, when you have ambitions or goals or projects. That is precisely that which the désoeuvre deconstructs. Galou, who appeared to us as first as the inscrutable anti-hero, or even the non-hero of Bautravail turns out to have been the post-hero of a community both exceptional in its extraterritoriality and exemplary in its paradoxes and contradictions. A community that is in transition between the old nation state and the yet to be defined post-national community where, where individuals share a common space but only on condition of their final irredeemable singularity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. And we have a few moments for questions and comments. Uh, they are also 
abject figures in the in the Darden Brothers films. You know, there you also have this this reevaluation of singularity and abjectness in relation to a new kind of sacredness and, and specificity. And very often these are not, you see, what interests me about is that none of them, or almost, almost none of them, I can't think of anyone who's actually uh, an immigrant. They're all white, middle class, and relatively well positioned. In other words, they are, you know, genuinely the old Europe, which comes to this crisis and has to rethink individuality and so on. And I think that's a, what I would say is the relation between the beauty of the image and the abjectness of the character, so that we don't treat these characters as social cases. So we, we're not tempted to thinking, oh, well, with a little more money or better education or social services, they would be lifted out of it. No. They're, you have to recognize the beauty of their existence in their singularity and in their abjectness. I think that's what uh, how I would uh, answer your very opposite. Yeah, I guess I don't know if it's, I mean, it might be more a comment rather than a question, but it comes back to the notion of désappointment. I said it, I said it in French on purpose, because the translation of this term is very uh, difficult, and I've been struggling my son mm -hmm. translation. So you have the inoperative, which is the title of yes. the Nazi's books, the translation of mm -hmm. English. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the notion of unworking, and there are also other attempts to Unwork is also a term for it, which yeah. is not really an English term, but has right. been used to, to at least hint at the complexity of his way. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not unemployed, you see. That's the, that's the other thing. We yes. might think that <laughs> yes. this is, again, you know, a kind of social, uh, social welfare problem. But this is also unemployed in a certain sense, because when we say of someone that he or she is désoeuvré, it means also this idea of L'absence d'œuvre, when the, uh, someone who doesn't have anything. No to project. Do, yes, no has no project. Yeah, well, being right. restless at the same time. Yes, being, wow, uh, that's trying to work on something but not going anywhere. And I think the film is also a beautiful metaphor of uh, what the French Legion or maybe the French Army, and with mm -hmm. regard to what you said about the nation, the community, yeah. and everything, um, no longer has to do. I mean, it no longer has this. Uh, this Colonial universalist project that the French right. religion had at the, at the very it, point. It can't, it can't claim to be the vanguard of a civilizing mission for the right, rest of exactly. mankind. It can't go and claim to bring the, the values of liberty, egalité, fraternité to all those benign things. So, so that's the notion of not having something, not having anything to do with being occupied at the same time. And you mm -hmm. mentioned that dimension. But there is another thing also. It's, at the very origin of the use of des absent absence uh, in Nancy's work comes from uh, Blanchot and Bataille and, mm -hmm. um, and Foucault also, yes. uh, defining the absence d'oeuvre as uh, the best definition that Foucault could find of madness, of uh, folly. And I think this is also, also a good point. That yeah. that yeah. Yeah. Madness and yeah. folly is, is, what, uh, is the, what affects. Right, that's so the, the madness of uh, Galoub at the end. Maybe I can just show you, uh, because I have a little extract. I don't have to go to the, the DVD. I, I hope I can show you that, that final madness of his, uh, his dance. Let's hope it has a player there. Thank you. 
Okay, the scene is a little bit longer and you see him turning and twisting, but there you have a, that's with the désœuvré and the... Right. But there is also a third notion in Earth or Désœuvrement, it's the fact that this is what the is talking about, uh, for example, the beautiful text of the man with his shoes. Um, there is a controversy about this uh, Earth, uh, Earth mm -hmm. now, uh, right? Um, that the has triggered uh, about the reading of Heidegger's interpretation of this. And the is pointing out and highlighting the fact that, uh, after all, what makes this an Earth is the is the absence that mm -hmm. sense, is the fact that uh, uh, there is no completion, there is no um, uh, no uh, fixed or definitive solidified interpretation, and I think uh, in this sense this is also showing the way of what what the, the film itself is as um, not showing the the duration, not having. This would be the proper of the artwork to not be an earth, mm -hmm. right? to be um, deprived from this aesthetic value yes. of the earth. And I think um, this is interesting because um, Claire Denis came up with this idea of, of making this film about the French region after the after Jérôme Clément from Arte, the TV mm -hmm. channel, asked her and other filmmakers to make films about the notion of being foreign in Europe today, and she came up with this, mm -hmm. which is a totally yes. different That's understanding right. of yes. what being foreign means. Exactly. Yes. And uh, but, but perhaps this is the development of, of the French cinema also that she right. showed. Right. Aside from the yes. old school you know, aspect, this is also the development of, of uh, filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, like I said, this is this is more. Of well, it's a, a very uh, suggestive comment. Yeah. We have time for one more. Hey, um, uh, have you seen the Havre, the French? That, yeah, did you see from, that? From Paris Mackey. Yeah, yes. yeah. Paris yeah. Mackey is one, another one right, of, right, of right. drifting clouds and uh, the man without a past. Right, right, right. I haven't right. seen the Havre, no, but uh, okay, okay. If, you're, if, yeah. you're, if it's associating you uh, yeah. with the Havre, then uh, we're on the, on the same okay. track, I yeah. think. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's definitely one of, one mm -hmm. of those who rework what it means to be European mm -hmm. through this, you know, abject, uh, um, you know, what I might not call the, the uh, I don't want to call it aestheticization, but investing it with a particular singularity and uniqueness uh, in, in the abject the marginal. I'm going to get back to what this is you start, which was the kind of decentral and the kind of the narcissistic one we talked about, the European cinema, which was Kind of published out there at a certain point is now part of kind of global cinema. And I was wondering if these films that have this formal meaning in this sense of kind of radical singularity, um, is there still a kind of international critical establishment that's still going to grow or is it going to become one of the as a kind of uh, an art cinema, which is sometimes mm -hmm. looking at it and it's looking at this and something like that, you know, about a body. It's all about the abject and all about the singularity and also all about the formal, you know, right. the <coughs> Is there a kind of vestigial fascination with these films that they reach a certain threshold um, that they're still going to be recognized as somehow, you know, this year's version of the European art film of the 1960s? Mm -hmm. you see what I mean? um, I, let, let me just preface this with saying that, that, that connecting it to the abject is, is what I've been doing. I don't know anybody who would use that particular concept uh, to bring these films together. And, um, if I had another life, I'd probably write a book about it. But, uh, <laughs> um, but what you can say is that these filmmakers that I mentioned, uh, and especially now Belata and Pedro Costa, have a fierce, loyal, fiercely loyal community uh, that actually prides itself in its marginality, in its separateness. In other words, this is not a cinema that either, even by, you know, by its admirers, would like to be popular. It's more like a secret society that knows something that others don't. I think it's, it's you know, if you come across uh, uh, those who value those films, you would see what a, what, what an almost ontological commitment they have to this kind of cinema. 
Uh, it, you can take it back to, I mean, the, the, the father of the cinema is uh, John Lee Stroud. <coughs> Uh, that, that is a tradition to which these, uh, not, not all the filmmakers, but certainly those who keep that tradition, if you say, you know, have an international, uh, forum, an international forum for these films, are people who uh, have grown up around uh, the, uh, the severity of the strong, etc. So I think all the lawyers have been at the in an interesting way, because I mean, we're bringing our view of the characters, which is lower, it's really not reprehensible, but it's so Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, thank you. Uh, once again, I'm so impressed with your uh, cinematic erudition as well as your, your scholarly mojo. <laughs> <laughs>